Okay, we'll probably never get it back. Okay, talk to you later. Bye. Okay, so um, who? Yeah, oh, we're facing that way. Who have we got um, with us? With I can see you, Chris. Yep, good. I'm definitely here, and I can hear You're you nice and clear. Okay. Um, yeah, have we got the. Uh, Ah, wow. Ah, now we're, we're in business. So we've got the Hanover Group. And, and I can see, yes, I can see Vitol's team. Yep. Robert. Um, Pack, you seem to have something on your face. There's something growing on your face. Yeah, they, they, what happened was they made me get up very early in the morning and I missed a bit. A bit. <laughs> okay. I think we're going to make a start, and as, as conference rooms join us, then we can take it from there. There's a bit so, of an echo going on. I don't know if you can hear that. That's the microphone. That's the microphone. So, is that any better? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is that any better? Yeah. Um, well, let's. Uh, I've got. Well, let's uh, have slides that um, have some less common problems. Uh, you will all be familiar with, with problems. You will all be familiar with. Let's start with this one first. So this is a one first. This is a a 30-year-old male who has who has in this. It's a dry central perforation. It's a dry central perforation. Only discharges when he gets water in the air. And his average air conduction thresholds are 30 decibels in the air, and air thresholds are 30 decibels. So you've got the air bone there. What he wants is he wants to know he wants to know his hearing. Now, first question that I have to then is, um, what Chris, Chris, what advice would you give him around the management of this situation? Right. So I think one has to say, you know, here's three options. You can have a conservative option, which would mean, mean avoiding getting wet, um, custom-made earplugs, hat if he swims, um, maybe manages hearing loss with an open-fit uh, hearing aid. And I suspect by the time he's got to me, he's probably discussed a lot of those things, and therefore he may well want surgery. That looks to me like that would be quite a suitable one for a per canal, uh, tragal, perichondral, tragal, perichondral graft, probably just fitting over the umbo. Um, I would give him a, probably, a, if it depends, I mean, the mucosa looks quite good there, good there so I think he's probably got a 90% chance of closing the oh. perforation. And realistically, his 20 decibel air bone gap, you're probably going to get about 10 decibels of that back for him. So depending, if his other ear is normal, uh, depending on the threshold of that, depending on the threshold of the super the hearing improvement, but he's likely to notice the hearing improvement. Uh, improvement. Um, so that's what I would. And then a third, <laughs> most of the third, I'm going to go for surgery with that hole. That hole. But obviously. But, but, come to you for an operation he just wants to know an operation no need in that yeah, area just, to make his hearing i told you all that i just you can do it conservatively with water yeah. precautions ear plug hat swimming a hearing aid open fit hearing aid i said all that okay okay and if he chooses so, to have that that's fine right if he so chooses you, not to then surgery i think would be a reasonable option for a 30 year old guy who's not able to swim right okay uh Vitol, can I, Vitol, ask you and your team in Poznan, would you offer this patient in, in, offer this patient in order to improve his hearing? To improve the hearing, because very often in this age, hearing, because this age, uh, to do something because they want to swim. Going to the south of, of Europe or south of uh, to swim. And they ask us, they press us, Ask, ask, we press to perform the surgery for, for swim, for, and it is of meringoplasty using two different techniques, using two but every time we repeat to this patient, time we repeat, we guarantee 100% of success.
100% of success, uh, success full rate, it's 80, 85% of cases. No, full rate, it's 85%. No, so when you say success, you mean in terms of closing the perforation, in terms of perforation, or? Well, it's, I think, with two parallel. When you have this perforation, you improve immediately the hearing. Uh, but much, much more often, the patients here ask us to close due to the problem of vacation time, of weekend time, for swimming. Right. Uh, Miguel, in Madrid, does closing a perforation make the hearing better? I, 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 I didn't take the case because I arrived a little bit late. I cannot see this in the screen. It's too small. Can you just uh, summarize it for me? Yeah, we need to make the to make the make the slide bigger, please. Make it bigger, please. We can make the picture of us smaller in the slide. So there is a perforation there, or is it just an atelectasis? No, no. There is a central perforation. It's dry. It only discharges when he gets water in his ear. His air conduction threshold is 30 dB. dB 10 dB on average, he's average hearing. Or a question about his hearing and whether it can be improved. And my question, or a question about, and whether it's for you in the tympanic man, does it make the hearing better? It might improve hearing, of course. I mean, we have to check the, the ossicular chain interoperatively and we can, uh, we can see if there is something else or if, if it would need. We cannot see the uh, the include a stapedial joint there, I, I, I'm not so sure, but I, I cannot see it let's, very well. Let's assume that the ossicular chain is normal and it's mobile. Yeah. And um, let, um, let That's the central perforation and 30 dB gap, yeah. is it? Yep. Yeah, correct. Correct. It might have fixation in the chain, yeah. Right, okay. So um, we've heard that... Um, Chris uh, quoted a 90% chance of closing the perforation, but he didn't quote a 90% chance of, chance of improving the hearing. Chris, can you just give us a figure for actually improving the hearing? What I said was, I think realistically you could expect that that guy's going to get about 10 decibels improvement in his hearing. And I think the chance of that, if you get closure, so in that 90%, it's probably about 80%. Obviously, he could develop an effusion. So we don't know about his eustachian tube function, but to yeah. me, right. the mucosa there. But to yeah. me, right. mucosa there looks pretty good. So I think okay. I'd be reasonably optimistic about this here. Reasonably optimistic about. Okay. Uh, what is the chance of improving the hearing in your hands? Well, I think it's more or less. Let's say. Well, I think it's more. Let's say 79 percent. That's great. 79.5. 79.3. So that sounds like you analyzed 100 cases and said, that sounds like you analyzed 79 got better. Okay, let's go over to, um, uh, to the Hanover group. Yes, um, I Hanover group. Um, that we can expect an improvement of, uh, that we can expect of uh, about as well. And the chance of closing the perforation is really, the chance of is really, percent it's very similar to the other um, uh, audience and uh, I think it's more or less the same we heard just so far and uh, I think I said more or less the same so far and uh, I said, uh, no we've lost uh, no well, it's... hello uh, yeah. Yeah. hi so uh, hi. what is this what hello uh, yeah. so s rate in closing this type of perforation and what is the perforation success rate in improving the patient's hearing? It, 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 it depends very much um, on and, uh, of course and, uh, and, uh, and the, the, the respiratory tract that can it can have that can it can have. Uh, anyway you were asking if uh, it, it will improve you were asking if uh, improve with the with, I think that if the chain is mobile and uh, and the, the if the chain is and uh, the, the, and with this uh, bone conduction decibels uh, the, with the tympanoplasty. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, the tympanoplasty is just not for improving the hearing, not for improving to give the patient a better quality of life. If he can have a closed eardrum, it would be much better. I live in a, in a that people 
like very much to swim and uh, it's very sure. important to have a, to have a, uh, to have a conditions for that just for that all right let me ask you the converse question then when you are counseling the patient and the patient asks you about the risks what is the risk in your hands of a severe to profound sensory to profound sensory um, I, 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 I tell my patients that they have more or less uh, between 80 and 90 percent of uh, chances to, to, to have a, a, a stable ear, a, a dry ear, and uh, uh, more or less 80 percent of chances to improve the hearing. As far as uh, risk, of course, there are risks, and I, I tell them that in a in a in a rate uh, if you're to to five percent, then it can have a, a bad result. Okay, uh, and complete loss of hearing, though it surely is not five percent. A zero point five. Of, of, of course not. <laughs> of course no, no, not. Sorry, but, I uh, didn't hear you clearly. Um, I said this. this I said, as far as total hearing loss, uh, no, it's it's very rare. Uh, so I have to, so that is really quite quite unusual, very rare to, to have that. Okay, so when the patient especially, asks, especially in a, in a simple case like that, okay, especially ask, in a um, yeah. uh, type one tympanoplasty and without uh, yeah. uh, tympanoplasty and without uh, stations or uh, tympanosclerosis and so on. Let me ask you, would you like a loss from a simple moringoplasty, or has it never happened in your practice? In a simple tympanoplasty, I never had. I had it right. with patients. Uh, I never had with the the, with the uh, simple tympanoplasty. I had it with with uh, uh, with other with with uh, sure. cholecystomas sure. and so on. Sure, Chris. When did you last have a dead ear from a moringoplasty? Never had one. Never had one. Okay, uh, Frank. Franco, uh, Franco in Florence. When did you last have a dead ear from a moringoplasty? Uh, I've never had any profound hearing loss after moringoplasty. So that's never, okay. All right. All right. And, um, and um, Vitol, have you ever had a dead ear from a moringoplasty? No, 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 okay. no, and no in the past. No. Yeah. 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 So what I'm saying is when we listen to in front of me on the screen I am seeing some of the world leading otologists and they are telling me that they have never thankfully had a dead ear from a moringoplasty and they have a between an 80 and a 90% success rate in a situation like this like this. The problem arises when patients go to see people not like you, i.e. leading otologists, but that's a debate for another day. That's a debate for another day. Okay, let's move on. Um, so, let's go over to um, the uh, Hanover Group. Um, Hanover Group, would you like to comment on this coronal high-resolution CT scan and the assessed? that I've put next to it. Oh, it's a, sorry, it's so small picture. Let's make it's, it bigger. It's really, it's really hard to say. I, I cannot okay. see what? it really. What, what should I see it really? What? Look, make it bigger for you. Look, we're going to make it bigger for you if we can. There you go. Okay. So, so old photo. So. Any thoughts, uh, Boca? Not, not really. I cannot recognize uh, the pathology. Um, I see an inner ear canal. I see your middle ear. I see your uh, malleus head and uh, uh, incus. incus. Oh. Okay. What, what I'm trying to show here. And this is only one section, only one section, and yeah, actually yeah. we now know that this is the incorrect section, but I'm trying to show you a dehiscence of the superior semicircular canal. Ah, that's your mean, yes, okay, it's fine. And, 
The first thing is, is that this VEM test does not belong to this scan because, well, you can see the right and the left are the other way around. But there you go. So let's, um, so, Boca, would you like to comment on your, your philosophy and your understanding of this condition? I'm not sure whether that uh, picture shows really um, an existing um, an um, open the canal. If you look to series um, with our CT scans, uh, for example, for our cochlear implant uh, population, um, we or, or our radiologists often say um, we have a, a um, open um, a superior semicircular canal. And I think it's um, not really clear whether that is true or not. And um, it's a little bit better if we compare that with the, compare that with the can, uh, with the cone beam. It's much more easier to say whether easier to say whether that's uh, real, that's uh, existent or not. I'm not really convinced that that what we have to see that that is really the truth. Do you think the condition actually? Maybe, but not so. Be, but not so not so many cases we we supposed to see. Okay, uh, Miguel, does this condition exist in Spain? Is there such a thing as superior semicircular canal dehiscence syndrome? Yeah, of course. I mean, it exists and it has has been published, and we see cases. But one has to be very cautious because uh, for me, probably is one of the conditions more overdiagnosed. Uh, that we are finding in ontology now. I agree with uh, my colleague that uh, uh, I, I was really astonished at the difference between a cone beam CT scan and a high resolution CT scan because, I mean, because as you, you even can have some shell of bone over it. So, over it. so I mean, it really should correspond. I mean, a patient has to have a clear vertigo, Tullius phenomenon, and all the things should uh, go uh, uh, together. To make sure that really that syndrome corresponds to that syndrome corresponds and that we can help that patient. So it's not so easy. For me, we're diagnosed, but of course it exists. I think, I think uh, Burkhard makes a very valid. Until recently, the gold standard imaging was high resolution CT in the plane of the Pyrrhic Canal, but now I think cone beam CT is probably the gold standard uh, imaging modality. Um, what about in Porto? Do you do search for this condition? Yeah, we like do. Uh, for, us, for us, I just operated one, one two months ago. Um, and uh, this is, this for us, very important is the, the clinical uh, and the, the physical examination. I think that the history of the patient and the examination are also very important uh, and, of sure. course, supported by the, 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 the radiology. Anyway, um, the, um, as I said, the, the, this young lady that I operated uh, two months ago, she had Hennebert sign and uh, Tullio phenomenon that were very disturbing for her. Anytime she closed her, anytime she a door, she, she said if it was strongly, it, she, she will, she will fail. So um, in such cases, I think that we can help a lot with the, with the surgery. A lot with the surgeon. Okay, and do you use the trastoid, the trastoid route, or a middle fossa? Middle, middle fossa, middle fossa. Right. Okay. Is there anyone uh, amongst you that does surgery for this condition? I, I took the beat. Chris, Chris, you do. Chris, what approach? So I, I don't do middle fossa approach. So I do trans trans uh, mastoid most of these patients have got very well aerated mastoid so it's easy to plug off from the trans mastoid approach and the interesting thing is that their symptoms are variable the interesting thing is that they're variable and generally speaking we're waiting for the noise induced vertigo one of the questions i was interested in is whether any of the panel have ever operated on these patients solely for conductive hearing loss because uh, i can get patients who present with conductive hearing loss and no other symptoms. Equally, I had a patient just a few weeks ago, and his only presentation was that he, and his only present that he could hear his eyeballs move, and you know he could very nicely hear a tuning fork on his ankle, nicely hear a tuning fork, but he had no vertigo, and I had to go. 
sensors we ra we would rarely operate on. So I don't so know if anyone has that. Does anyone, well, hang on, Chris. Why they got a conductive hearing loss? Or let me rephrase it. Are you sure they've got a conductive hearing loss? Or is it a pseudo-elevation of the bone condition of the bone thresholds? No, I think conductive hearing loss, they've got a reduced, they're losing energy uh, from when it, when it, through their third window, in effect. So it's not getting to the cochlea um, when it comes via the stapes. So I think they genuinely have got suppressed um, air, air conduction thresholds. Yeah. I, I Would have, anyone have... I have one patient who I operated on, and I thought had got otosclerosis, and when yeah. he wasn't any, and when yeah. he wasn't any better, had done a, a magnificent operation, which had gone basically was suddenly worried, and when we scanned him, he clearly got superior semicircular canal dehiscence, circular canal dehiscence, and the piston was clearly so I, and I don't think I'm the only world who's done that. There are other people who, you know, this is what they used to call at the house clinic a cochlear conductive hearing loss. They operated and they didn't get better. And yeah. everything else seemed, you know, they'd reoperate and find everything was in place. Everything was in place. They genuinely get a conductive loss. So um, that's interesting. Robert, can I just ask you, do you think that based on what we've heard from Chris, every patient with suspected otosclerosis should have a high resolution CT scan or a cone beam CT scan? Well, this is interesting. In important interesting question. Now, I would say by law in France, or not really by law, but it's a kind of a global decision in France saying that we need to ask for a preoperative scan just to rule out uh, mainly uh, uh, this kind of situation, which I think this is pretty stupid because it's pre is very rare. It's pre is very rare. Uh, asking for a CT for all patients uh, doesn't seem really interesting. As you said, also you really need to have very well made uh, CT to be able to CT to be able to uh, uh, clear image. Uh, I think that I think it's it's not a good idea. Good idea. I think it's better surgery and to ask for a CT in case of failure. But this is what we have to do now. But uh, because if the patient sues you, then you you lose if you do the ask. But I think it's stupid, to be honest. Right, let's move on for the sake of time. Now, there's just an interesting point that I would like to point out, is that in, we ha also have patients uh, having simultaneous stapes fixation and a descent of uh, superior semicircular canal of uh, Supernal. So that's an interesting question. I have a patient I saw last week um, was been, who has been operating on one side long time ago for osteogenesis imperfectus. Osteogenesis imperfectus fixation. He had, and then he just, uh, he was operated by another surgeon. And then he came to see me uh, three months ago uh, for a uh, conductive hearing loss on the opposite year. So I decided to operate, of course, because everything was fine. And I asked for a CT because we have to do it. So then I received a CT and the CT seems to show uh, decent suspicion of decency. It's always difficult. It's not clear. And I fully agree with Burkhardt. So I canceled, I canceled the surgery to, to tell him because th there was this decent. But then, of course, he went to tell him because decent. But then, of course, discussion together. And we decide together to surgery. Uh, of course, a low uh, incidence of uh, success rate with this kind of situation. But we don't know because he had no airborne gap in the past. And he was operating in the opposite year with a good result. So I think it's a I think it's, a, it's clear an indication of surgery, so that's an interesting point also to discuss. This is, needs to be a point-to-point -point or face-to-face -face discussion with the patient before doing to, going to surgery. Um, just to respond to the question whether you should do a CT scan on primary stapes, I think the same question would should be, uh, should we do uh, a CT, uh, CT scan on revision? And of course... Of course, I think we all agree that we should. So we did a study and we looked at the incidence of, of uh, dehiscent uh, in hip surgery for all the patients that we get and of our own failures. And we, in the whole series, we could not find any, find any dehiscent. So this is a thesis of one of my, my PhD students that uh, was finished last year. Anybody interested? We can. These questions we looked at and answered to that extent and. There's no um, no increased no. actually maybe a protective 
uh, issue in haute sclerosis and uh, the, in conjunction with uh, dehiscence. So what is your position now? Now we'll go in do you, do you ask for a CT for this or did you change your mind? Robert, we do, uh, and I think like you, in all revision surgery we do CT scan, in all primary no. we do not. I think that's a health oh. economic discussion, health oh. economic discussion, and uh, I don't, for me it has no added value to do a CT scan in primary surgery. Of I agree. And I agree. there's a health, health economic issue and there's uh, a patient uh, radiation issue, I think, to that. And it's radiation and cost, cost issue yeah. too. He health economic, yes. Okay. Yeah. Shaq wants yeah, the microphone yeah. back. Okay. Shaq wants yeah, the microphone yeah. back. Okay. I'm going to keep thinking. Robert, can we just stay with you then for this next case? Let's just uh, let's make this slide uh, bigger for a second. Otherwise, you won't be able to see it. This is a 60-year-old male. Okay. Now, Robert, I want to stay with you. This is a canal wall down tympanomastoid operation that you did as a resident. And then he disappeared and he's back with an ear that looks like this. Okay, there is a significant hearing loss, there is pus, there is granulations, cholecystoma. The opposite ear is normal. Robert. What do you think this? This was your handiwork. What will your unit do for this? I can't believe I did that when I was a resident. <laughs> so right. But there's a clear indication for a revision, of course, in this case. And uh, as you know, Shaq, I'm not doing my self cholesteatoma uh, surgery, so I would probably ask Benoit or uh, Thibault to do it. But Benoit or uh, Thibault to do it. There is an indication of revision because, uh, as you know, we use this technique with Benoit, uh, who introduced this technique in the clinic. It's clearly uh, an indication for surgery in this case, of course. Okay. Um, can we go? Okay. Um, can we go, uh, Florence? Fr Franco, what is your surgical technique? What is your in this situation? Uh, this situation, of course, sir. we need a surgical toilet of all the debris of the surgical toilet on breeze of the carotid. We must reduce the height, must reduce the facial reach, our facial mastoid segment to reduce the, the facial reach. I remove all the I remove all, all the tympanomastoid cell and then I try to obliterate the mastoid okay, so cavity yeah. with coloperiosteal flap and cartilage. And I do uh, rather little, rather small uh, meatoplast. So you're going to make this cave, cave bigger? No, bigger. No, 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 bigger. Smaller. Because first of all, we eliminate the disease. The second, we reduce the facial reach and uh, we remove uh, the mucosal cells. And then we, mucosal, then we obliterate the cavity to reduce the ah, okay. of the cavity. With the muscle periosteal flap and cut, and then I look at a very short, very, very small neatoplasty in order to. So uh, you're going to what? Well, you're going, to, you're going to, uh, to replicate. I think we should end, go to. Of, we should end, go. To show, when, when they do this kind of operation, even if at the beginning do this kind of operation, even at the end with a protective operation, with a protective, uh, sometimes difficult to understand if you perform. Uh, to understand and close Do we have the wise man in Antwerp? Do we have in, in Antwerp? Yes. Erwin, can you? Yes. yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, Hello? we hear you. This, yeah, this, yeah, case, yeah. Is, this, this, yeah, this yeah, case is, this case yeah. is for you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well. Uh, Erwin, would uh, you like to come? Comment. We, we, I can tell you that. Anyway, uh, anyway, uh, first of all, what I would do, clean it, then ask um, for imaging, um, certainly a, a, a cone beam CT oh, about the bone, how much bone I have, at the trauma, etc. And um, I want also to make sure that there's no intracranial uh, issues, but. Probably there aren't. If I would be in doubt, I would have an MR. 
Right. Um, then I would do a bony obliteration technique, uh, like the kind I just showed, like the kind earlier on. Um, and, and it can't well what's happening at the level of the middle ear. It's it's a dark hole, seemingly. It, yeah, it's it's full of uh, granulations and pus. Yeah. So I would clean out everything and then use an allograft for construction and put in a canal wall, bony canal wall, sculpted bone, and fill up the cavity. Make sure I clean it well, make sure I leave no skin, skin. and then at one and five year post-op, I would ask for a non diffusion weight MRI to make sure there's no residual. I would follow up these cases for at least 10 years at a yearly rate and uh, longer. You know, you know, it's a bit egoistic. I follow them up longer now because then I can work longer. <laughs> yeah. Vigold, uh, what would you do in this situation in Poznan? Well, so when we have a, such an important recidive of the cholesterol of course we ask our radiologist for imaging because we, ha we have to know if the cholesterol is not going to the top of the pyramid. Because if you have the, 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 such an important cholesterol, you have to enlarge your, your surgery. Your, your surgery. And after this, this cavity, we, we are going to the surgery, of course, to, to remove the surgery, of course. The whole cholesterol, enlarge the entrance to the external auditorial, and to ask the space after the surgery, after one year or two years, for the reconstruction. Thank you. And what is the what is the approach to this situation in Uppsala? Uh, uh, sorry, can you repeat it? We are disconnected all the time here. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Perfect. Okay. I can hear you. Perfect. Okay, I, 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 can't, I can't. I can't read a PowerPoint presentation. Okay. So, so let let me just summarise for you. Just summarise for yes, uh, a patient with a previous cell wall down. Tympanomastodectomy, yes. and 10 years later, the patient comes with a discharging ear. The ear is full it's of cholesterol, granulation, Timmy, and comes with a discharging granulations, and cholesterol, and there is a moderate, and cholesterol, a moderate. Well, well, uh, <coughs> if it's <coughs> if it's discharge. I would perform a radical cavity reconstruction, and I would uh, construction would uh, c clean the cavity and uh, also clean the mirror. I would build reconstruct uh, the canal wall using cartilage, and I would obliterate the mastered cavity with, with bone chips and, and or with bone chips or bone pate. I would cover it with a muscular periosteal flap. And I would reconstruct the uh, middle ear with a tympanoplasty. I'm using fascia and autologous material. That's clear. So, Chris, ask you a question. Is the, are the days of this type of radical cavity now in the history books? Because everyone in the history, because everyone's writing. So yeah. that is now a standard of, so yeah. that is there. Is that correct? Uh, I'm not sure if it's universal in the UK, but more and more uh, it's universal. The more we teach on our cases, and they are pretty much all inherited cases because I don't do open cavities. Uh, pretty much all in because I don't do open. The other guys, we're using bone pate cartilage, reconstruct the drum with cartilage, fill the mastoid up with bone pate. Bone pate cartilage, construct the drum with cartilage. Pate. But I'm not sure of people in the UK who are creating cavities like this. So um, hopefully getting fewer. I think what I think okay, cavities like this, getting fewer. I think, you know, it's fine for suction, but very many of, the, many of the patients who come with thick sets of notes and they've had 100 visits over 40 years, they come twice a year. And the reason they come twice a year is we don't want to see them twice a year. Is we don't need more than that. And if you speak to them, they say, well, you clean out the ear, me drops, and it's leave for three weeks, and then it discharges for five months, and then I come and see you again. And I don't think that... Okay, if they're 90 or 80, but if they're younger, I think we should be revising these cavities. Um, so hopefully it will become absolutely the standard of care. I'm not quite sure we're there yet. That's very helpful.
Chris, um, can I just ask uh, Pro Professor uh, Burkhard, is it acceptable to have an ear like this in Germany? Uh, no, of course not. I would uh, go uh, to the surgery as well as, well as uh, other, uh, the other colleagues. And um, the, the main goal would be, of course, to uh, um, remove all the cholesteatoma, all the granulation tissue, all the connective tissue in the middle ear, um, which is perhaps present, to improve the hearing if it's possible. And um, I would try to make the cavity smaller, perhaps to remove the um, facial recess a little bit more, that you have more uh, view into the cavity and try to make it small, smaller as well. Thank you. I'm going to, going to move. Does anyone have any other comments? Oh, uh, any comments from Porto? Professor De Silva? Well, uh, uh, for this patient, I, I'm not sure. I, I used to do a lot of obliterations as a primary surgery. But primary surgery. In, in this case, the old man probably is not concerned about uh, water inside the ear. And uh, with this um, hearing loss, uh, I think I will not... Uh, even I will, I will not have not too much material to, to reconstruct. Of course, I can have cartilage, but um, pate and so on, it will be maybe difficult to have a, a safe bone to reconstruct. So, probably in this case, for this, this case, for this, for this special case, I, I will do a revision without reiterating, keeping an open cavity, and, uh, and then uh, that's all. Thank you. Erwin, one final comment I'd like to ask you to ask you that if, if a surgeon creates an ear, ear like this, do you think that is, do you think a failure to reach an acceptable standard modern age? Uh, well, if you look at the picture, uh, this is certainly not acceptable to the patients, but don't forget we all have our uh, traditions in, in teaching and learning, and I think we are now we are now at a point, um, and I, I wouldn't shoot down our predecessors because they made cavities, because I seem to remember a study because they made cavities. I seem to remember that's not so long ago in in the United Kingdom, where about seven, there was a survey where about seven, there were about seventy percent of the cholesteatoma cases with techniques. That's not so long ago. Uh, those cavities, the majority of them, are still around. So uh, I'm very glad to see this switch to a closed, uh, closed um, peaks. But, and this is a very but, your technique needs to be impeccable if you use closed technique. If you don't impeccable, if you don't have a good technique, then it sucks because you get the pathology out, and you're going to leave gaps in the wall, etc., etc. So in the wall, etc., etc. So. Technique is only is only if you if you really perform it well, and uh, there's a, a long and a steep uh, learning curve, I think. So I, uh, what I want to say is, we need excellent training for uh, the young surgeons to reach a level that they can avoid open techniques. Techniques. Can we remark all very well in our countries. Uh, I would not use closed techniques or obliteration. If I could not be sure the patient was coming back to me, back to me over the years, if I could not have access to imaging, so these are really two um, uh, conditions or preconditions to apply a bony obliteration technique. You need to be able to guarantee the patient, and if you have good imaging, or and you don't follow up the patient, you can't. So that's what I wanted to say. Just, just a, a word of warning that sometimes you sit at the table and you open an ear that was, opera was operated on by somebody 20, 20 years ago, and you say to the trainee, look in the notes, who did this cavity? Because they should looks high or something else. And the trainee says, you did. <laughs> and you can sometimes look into an open cavity. You know, when I was training in the UK, open cavity was de rigueur, de rigueur. It, it changed. But you can go back into a but cavity that you thought to lies, the favor, everything was nice and low, and you do get new bone growth, and you could think, I believe I did that. And a couple of cavities I've been back into over the years,
that I've been back into over the years, I've thought, I'm ashamed, and I'm not sure that I did it that badly. And I think you do get that badly. Do, the cap all was the fault of the original surge. You're sometimes a bit quick to blame colleagues. That's a good point. Just one final comment. If I could, just one final comment from you, Chris. Uh, within the here in Utrecht, we have senior, we have senior and young consultants. Uh, and the they have is, well, what are they supposed to do? They haven't got oh, with the Professor of Fissier's years of obliterating cavity experience. They haven't got oh, with the Fissier's years of... What are they supposed to do? Well, I mean, hopefully if they're in Utrecht, they'll get high-quality training. What are they supposed to do? Well, I mean, hopefully they're in Utrecht training. I think the role for newly qualified, consult qualified consultants in their first few years. And a lot of the programmes are turning out people who are slightly light on expense. But, uh, I mean, my feeling is that uh, what we should be aiming for is closed cavities. Um, I think there's a move towards primary, primary obliteration, although that's far from universal. I would really um, agree with Owen that, you know, certainly agree with Owen that you know, certainly if you have a recurrent disease, I think you should obliterate. But I think in terms of learning, you have to, get to, you have to go to theatre a lot. If they're in theatre a lot, if they're blessed because watch me opt every Thursday... So they get wonderful tuition. Is that not right, Wilke? Yes, but that's why the question arose, though. But anyway, <laughs> uh, uh, I think it's a very right question for the, the, the young consultants, because I think with the European Union, and we're all being forced a number of years of training to, uh, to get harmonization between uh, the countries, to uh, get between uh, the countries. I do, at least it's a discussion. We are going to differentiate in differentiology consultants and rhinology or whether the whole spectrum should still be with all the uh, consultants anyway and I think colesteatoma has become a rare disease we see it left anyway uh, we do see revisions but uh, but uh, the, uh, primary colesteatoma I think it uh, is decreasing I'm sure if that's the impression everywhere but we see less colesteatoma okay. okay I'm gonna move this along just uh, for expediency um, this this um, this needs a simple uh, yes no answer actually. Uh, okay, uh, I won't I, I won't. Uh, we'll start in Florence. I'm going to go around the uh, the, uh, uh, the thumbnails that I can see. We'll start in Florence. Um, uh, Franco, do you use facial facial nerve monitoring for tympanomastoid surgery? Yes. Yeah? No. I use it for posterior fossa procedures, but for middle ear surgery. I use it only for medical legal issues. Usually, I have an operating theater. I switch on the monitoring and put the LEDs. And uh, but let me tell the truth: I don't check this. And I don't believe it. Uh, so, only, Franco, only, is is that a yes or a no? Uh, yes. It's a yes. Okay. It's a yes. It's perhaps not for the right reasons, but it's a yes. Okay. Um, what about uh, in Uppsala? Yes, we always do. And uh, Hanover? This is for tympanomastoid surgery. No, Bocard. never. I, I, never. I, I, never. I, I, never. I never use it. Never. Okay. In Porto? Tympanomastoid surgery, facial nerve monitoring. Almost never. Only if I have a, a cholesteatoma with uh, that radi radiology tells me that I have... Uh, uh, exposition of facial nerve or something like that, but in usually surgery, no. Okay, we thank use you. It, we, use it today, we use it today for a cochlear implant, but not in, in, in usual surgery, <coughs> not right. in TVMI side surgery. Robert, uh, for your kids that do this, in, in, is it a yes or a no? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Chris? Chris? I thought this was a sonar from John's boat, actually. I thought it was a boat, <laughs> um, boat actually. Uh, no, we, we, we use it whenever we, we say whenever we have a drill. We use it whenever, whenever we have a drill in. We use it. Uh, Vitold, Poznan? No, no. We are not no. using the monitoring uh, uh, system. Erwin? Yes, we are using it. Okay. Uh, Miguel? Uh, no, never in primary cases, exceptionally in revision cases. Okay, so we have about a 50-50 split amongst 
the, the leading otologists that are present at this uh, conference, if I can put it that way. Chris, what does this mean? It means if you live in Northern Europe, you need it, and if you live in Southern Europe, you don't need to bother. But they don't use it in Hanover. They don't use it in Hanover, that's true. No, okay. Yeah, so... It's Sweden, Antwerp, okay. you know, the yeah. real North. Yeah. Real North. I, I, yeah. I think the problem with it in the UK, it's got to the stage where lots of people use it, and I think if you have a facial nerve palsy and you go to court, and the judge sh puts a picture and says, do you recognise, and you say yes, yeah. and they say, do you have one, and you say yes, and they, they tell us where it was on the day, and they, they tell us where it was on the operation and you say it was in the box of the operating theatre and the, and the barrister, do you think it might have helped had it in the face? Then I think you're going to lose the case in the UK, but, but clearly not in Poland. And I agree with the guy. I mean, I've operated for many, many years without it. And I, I think it's probably not much, I think it's probably not much, not particularly useful. But I think if you own one in the UK and you choose not to use it, and you get a palsy, then you're in trouble. So, so overall, Franco gave the most honest answer. Well, you all gave an honest answer, and I'm grateful to you all. Answer, and I'm grateful to Franco gave the best answer. Is it, but for the wrong reasons. Yep. Okay. Let's move on. Uh, let's not do that. Uh, nor that. Now, can we just make this full screen? Because. Um, I, I think that this is one of the most difficult surgical problems with face. And basically, this is a 29-year-old female who'd had primary staples surgery two years previously and had a very, a very good result. And then for four months, she noticed it was deteriorating. And, then, and there you can see the, the pure tone audiometry and so on. And so on. And... Uh, and it was undertaken, the prosthesis was in the middle ear, and there is necrosis of the long process of the incus. I'm, I'll try and point this out. Perhaps it doesn't show it very well. Uh, and the facial nerve is just lying. The prosthesis was in the middle. There is necrosis of the incus. Very well. So the, let's go back to the lemonade. Well, Robert, let's start with you, because you have devised a solution for this problem. Let's go back. Well, this problem already. Just give, give us a summary of how yeah. your unit or you have devised a solution for what I think is of how your unit devised a solution for what I think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, no, this is one of my cases. Uh, no, of my cases. No, well, of course, you know my answer. I would do a malleus to stapedotomy procedure uh, using. Uh, in most, uh, I would do a malleus procedure uh, in most of the cases. And in some cases where I have, some cases I have uh, not to the stapes foot plate, then I would use a, a total malleus. Then I would use total malleus piece using. Um, uh, frequently inst and stop using it because I had some problem with his neck in some occasion with a reaction panning membrane but I know that Chris is using a lot and in some cases I'm using this technique also which is quite not bad but Teflon is sometimes well tolerated by the tympanic membrane so I would do it a malleus 2 stapedotomy procedure and when you analyze your results, I know you've done this when you paired that group of patients as their own controls, that is, compared to their uh, audiometric results from the primary surgery, how many of them reached the same result as their primary surgery? Oh, I don't remember. I published that in autology, in autology so I don't get the answer. But it's uh, in terms of success rate, my success rate uh, on primary surgery is 95-96%. Uh, on revision, it de clearly depends on the cause of failure, and uh, the worst success rate, worst success rate related to eroded incus and dislocated incus. So it's clear that it's much more difficult to ach achieve uh, a complete closure of the airborne gap in ca in case of uh, eroded incus. But of, uh, but I mean, it's probably around uh, in 50 and 60, something sure, like sure. this. I think I remember your presentation. Your present it was more than half, but it was still a but it was still number that didn't achieve that primary result yeah. that you achieved. Yeah, so, uh, 
achieve that price. Yeah, so, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, um, Shaq. The, the most difficult thing by doing um, Shaq, the difficult thing the procedure exactly, uh, from the Malice to the Stapis food plate is to the Stapis a difficult point. And, and, and in my series, and, and in my revise my own revised failure, I found that uh, the uh, uh, first uh, um, going malice to state procedure was related to uh, related to uh, short prosthesis, which means that it's more difficult to determine exactly the distance. Okay. So let's, uh, Miguel. Can I just ask you? Um, yeah. I, I, you do state surgery, or are you just doing lateral skull base and? No, no, I am also doing stapes, sorry, not you as regularly surgery. as Robert and so on, yeah. but uh, I'm doing sure. it. Sure, well, well, very few of us are doing the same volume as Robert, but are you able to achieve the same results as Robert with your incus necrosis, or what, what has been your experience? No, but first of all, uh, I, I'm, I'm looking at the screen, but that's a 15 dB airborne gap and 10 dB airborne gap and 10 sides, so uh, I don't know the reason why to reoperate this patient. Uh, I don't know the reoperate this space 15 dB airborne gap. Uh, I'm, that's what's written in the screen. In the so, so that's the average air airborne gap. I'm, that's what's written. So that's the average air conductive loss. So it looks uh, it looks difficult to improve that uh, preoperative situation. But if if loss, so it's difficult to improve. That, but if just uh, I, I don't have experience, of course, with. Don't have experience of malleus relocation. So, uh, just bending the prosthesis and trying to incus again. I have used that. And in cases in which you don't, uh, you have uh, once uh, erosion of the incus and dislocation of the incus at the same time. They have used the, the, the same incus, inter incus, with some graft over the, the foot plate, and it have worked very nicely. Let me say, and it have worked. Very uh, of course, that, that's not as good to obtain uh, the same result as Robert, but that's one uh, in the cases. I have never used the malleus uh, to foot plate prosthesis. Yeah, just with reference to that audiogram, the, you see the patient's air conduction threshold, the patient's air conduction significantly better than 40 after the first surgery, and the, that bone conduction, I think we're seeing the Carhartt effect in there, so probably there is a more significant bone, uh, air bone gap there. Um, so, uh, what about in Uppsala? Uh, do you have a solution for the Are we able to do the Robert Vincent technique? Is, it, is Robert's technique translatable, translatable to an average person like me? <laughs> We've just lost your sound. Because I'm French. You're saying that because I'm French, right? No, no, no. We're just. Uh, You're saying that because I'm. Fr no, no, no. Okay, I'm good. We, we, we can't hear you uh, in. Up we, we, we can't in Uppsala. Your mic. Um, let, let. Um, we hear yeah. you. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, we are used to this uh, technique because we invited uh, Robert some years uh -huh. ago, and he made uh, this surgery in the clinic. Well. Uh, uh, and I am performing it, and I, 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 I think there is good results. I don't want to to, <laughs> to tell me tell you all. But uh, first, for this patient, I, I think there is two uh, important things: is that you have to talk with the patients about the hearing aids too, uh, because she really has to hear the, the advantage with the surgery and the advantage with the advantage with hearing aid. And as you it's quite a, a little, uh, airborne gap, but uh, if the patient uh, if the uh, is uh, really suffering and having problems, really suffering, she's young. Surgery with the malleus relocation. The malleus. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jack, you, you need to see Shaq, You need to invite me in your institution now. I <laughs> look that do. way. Uh -huh. Well, no, we're, we're going to find out whether your techniques are. Uh -huh. Well, no, we're, we're good. your techniques are transferable skill is the correct term. Uh, Irwin. That's for Chinese. Erwin, is technique a transferable skill? Are you able to do it? I, I, think, I think all good techniques are transferable. Are transferable. That's what I think. I also agree with Robert that malleo vestibular malleo vest is one of the most difficult. One of the most difficult. That's why we look for another solution.
I will open. It's, it's going to be published soon now. Uh, we've spoken about it. We did a study of vestibular pistons. Um, and then consecutively, we did a series of uh, automimics reconstruction, bone cement, hydroxyapatite bone cement reconstruction of the incus, which includes the loop of an of 0.4 Teflon piston, right? Right? And um, although both if, uh, if results, the results with the mimics are clearly better, and it's far easier. That is for me the, the, the main point. I, it, and I think in less experienced hands, probably a lot safer. So I would say give it a try. It's, it's really worthwhile. It's, it's easier to do, and it solves a difficult problem in a neat way. That's my experience. All right, thanks. Uh, Burkhard, in Hanover, uh, how, how do you manage this situation? <laughs> <laughs> I would try to perform a, uh, we call that malo vestibulopexy. It's the same principle, I think. Same principle, I think. But uh, we have to be honest, it's very hard to um, close uh, the airborne gap. It's about uh, 15 dB, so, so far I can see here. And um, we have to counsel the, the patient, of course, that the other possibilities would be, for example, a hearing aid or implantable hearing plant to be hearing it or something like that like that that we have in that situation the lost uh, stay pieces uh, that uh, um, airborne gap of about 15 db mm. and i think it's hard to close and we have to we have to have a high we have to we have to have a high hearing loss or a depression loss or a of the threshold or where to perform that mellow vestibular pain. Okay. And can I just invite a comment uh, uh, in uh, Porto? Yes, um, unfortunately, um, I have Robert's hands, so use mine. I'm not sure <laughs> if I can do a, a malus uh, I never tried. Anyway, I think in this case I would move to a malus foot plate prosthesis or, uh, to, 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 try, to try to repair this. Anyway, as uh, the friends from Hanover were saying, it's very difficult to understand why she, she, she has a, just, a, just a small airborne gap with a, with a, a prosthesis uh, that is inside the middle ear, inside the felt in the middle ear. Yeah, I, I, th I think we're seeing an artifact of measuring bone conduction thresholds there, there in reality. I think, I, I think we can assume that the cochlear function is normal in that ear. Uh, Chris, transferable skills, you did you transfer, did you transfer them to Robert or did Robert transfer them to you? <laughs> no, no, they're, they're, they're all coming from the French. I, I've done um, various relocation techniques. Um, I find it it's slightly difficult when it's re relocated to get the to get the length to get the length because the malleus becomes very mobile. And my preferred technique, as Robert said, is just a straightforward uh, malleo uh, vestibular pexy. I have done the cement technique that Erwin talks about, but I have to say we use the Serena Sems. And although I got short, short term <laughs> results, uh, they necrosed over time. So I sort of came away from cement, and, and having spoken to Erwin, I think maybe otomimics is a good idea. Is a good idea. And then the other thing I've done recently is again transferable skill from Robert is to use the MR, the malleus replacement prosthesis, where you put a titanium uh, malleus uh, replacement directly over the, the foot plate, and then you put a large loop Teflon piston directly onto it. And I think that can get you out of trouble as well. So there's a variety of techniques, but my favorite one at the moment is malleo vestibular pexy. If the mimic will stay long term, then it's certainly, as Owen says, it's easy. And anything that's, e anything that's easy is easier to transfer, that's all. Thank Chris. We've just got a comment term, from uh, John through. and also from Vilko as well. Uh, just a comment for anybody that does do this. Um, this is the one occasion. Uh, where certainly the revision prosthesis that Robert and Chris has used in the past, and I still use, is reasonably heavy. You need to reduce the size of the cap on it to reduce the weight, and you need a fair size vein graft, because the last thing you want is the uh, distal tip penetrating uh, into the vestibule. Penetrating, uh, into the vestibule. Yes, and I think that's a very right comment. You need to use a vein graft if you, if you do the malleus relocation because of the mobility otherwise. And I mean, that's very important to start trying that, I think. Uh, the other thing is uh, there are some nice, at least I use some nice quartz prosthesis that if the, the erosion is not... Uh, just
prestige is that Ifshin is not uh, just the, the, the distal part. The, the, it will use a clip piston on this and have a firm grip and say have a second chance on the stapedotomy. On, on this and say have a second chance. Okay, so let's um, move to our so let's um, final case. Large screen for a moment, Bert. Sorry, last time now. So uh, large screen moment, Bert. So. It's an axial T2 weighted MRI. It's an axial MRI. How old the patient is because it's your scan. The patient is because it's your scan. And mild hearing impairment. Intracranial diameter of the 0.2 centimeters. So the question I'm going to ask you all is, would you elect for serial imaging? Would you elect for stereotactic radiotherapy? Would you elect for tumor resection? Or would you elect for tumor resection with attempted hearing preservation? So let's, for the final time, go back to the thumbnails, Bert. I know it's been a long day. It has been for all of us. Um, we're just going to get the thumbnails up. And then... Okay. Uh, get the thumbnail. Okay, let's... How... This is the age. You, it's you. This is your scan. This is your scan. This is a scan. Yep. <laughs> I cannot operate myself. I know. <laughs> That's ruled out. No, but I, I will tell you what I would do with any other uh, patient. Uh, so I am very, very young, you know. So, <laughs> uh, so probably, um, definitely, I not radiate that uh, tumor, and uh, probably I will. Uh, I would follow it. I would follow it initially. It's not because it's me. Uh, it's what I probably will do with. Will do with now. Uh, why? Why don't we consider removing that? So easy. I think it's similar to a case here. You show. I mean, the the, the internal artery canal. The internal practically free. So it seems a surgery, very direct through over approach. Uh, that allows you to preserve hearing could do, but this is very true. Uh, that allows you could do, but you can lose hearing even though very easy. So, probably, easily I would follow that uh, tumor to see if it's growing or not, and then when decide. Would, when, Miguel, when would be your next scan? How long after this scan? Six months after the first one. And then, if Six that is still the same? The one. And then, if it's not growing, one year. And then, if it's a year. Each year, Each year for how many for years? The first, for the first five years, for sure. Okay, thanks. Let's go to Uppsala. They may have a different perspective. No, we, we don't. I fully agree. Uh, if this is a young patient or an old patient, it doesn't matter. Uh, we, know from, uh, we know from the papers in Copenhagen that most tumors stop, uh, stop growing after five years. So I would... Uh, I would for a, uh, a repeated MRI scan in six months, and if no growth, I would wait 12 months and then each year, exactly. Ex and then, exactly. Like, yeah? So you would basically watch as your hearing gradually deteriorated, even though, even though there is no growth. Why would you not have the tumor removed with hearing preservation surgery? Well, because we, it's... We, we, Okay, we use we use uh, middle fossa approach for for hearing preservation, and we, we can say in about 50% we can pres preserve hearing. Uh, and um, and um, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't see the image anymore. But uh, how did he, was the hearing? There's, yeah, I can't see. I can't. Class A hearing. Class A hearing. It's it's no normal hearing. Yeah, class A. Class A. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well. Uh, uh, it depends. Well, it depends on the age. If we, we choose to 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 uh, to perform hearing preservation in this case, but I would wait. I would wait for six months and to see if it's growing. And uh, of course, it's individual. I will would always discuss with the patient. All right, Vitold, this is your this is your scan. This is not any patient. This is you. This is you. I understand very well, and will decide for surgery. Surgery. And would you have 
would you sacrifice or would I, you have an I haven't well, went through the labyrinthine route or have an attempt at I, hearing preservation? No, 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 no. I can sacrifice my hearing, but I can't sacrifice my facial nerve. Okay, so, so you... I, no, I'm listening, I'm listening. What would, so, so just tell us what you would do. So I ask my surgeon, perhaps somebody from this audience, to save my facial nerve if possible, to save my hearing, but first to, to save my <laughs> facial nerve. Okay, Chris, this is your scan. UK, almost universally, these would be followed. So six months and then annual scanning, just like the others. But I think, compared again to some of the other centres, I suspect there's a great, greatly higher take-up of gamma knife, stereotactic radio surgery, and not having the head opened. So right. for me, I'd have serial scanning, and when it comes to, if it's getting bigger or if my hearing's going off, I think I'd have gamma knife. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Okay, thanks. Erwin, what would you do? I, I totally agree with Miguel. I would do what he, would, what he does. That's exactly our policy here. Right, okay. And uh, Professor De Silva in Porto, if this was your I, scan? I, yeah, I agree totally with Chris Aldrin. I, first, I will, will wait and scan, and if it grows, I rather prefer a gamma knife treatment. Okay, okay. Have we got... Uh, uh, I think we're looking at Istanbul now. Batman, can you hear us? Yes. Welcome. Can you switch your microphone on? Yes. Uh, uh, Dr. Botman will have a flight and uh, he, ha he has to leave. Uh, we follow you, your discussion from Istanbul. All right. my, na my name is Tekin from, Mar from Marmara University School. Professor Batman, unfortunately, has to leave. All right, not to worry. We'll, we'll carry on. Okay. Uh, Franco. What would you do? This is your scan. Nobody else's. This is you. Yes. Uh, first, the tumor is touching the breast. Second, the fundus is completely free. Third, I am not young, but not so old. Then, in conclusion, I will ask uh, Jack Magnan to be operated to a retrosimoid approach in clinic course to try to preserve my hearing. Okay, very interesting. Uh, Robert. Well, that's a, I'm very happy to see this because, as you know, this CT scan, I got it when I was a resident. And so I need to know if this tumor is uh, increasing in size or not. So <laughs> okay. no, I think I would, I would agree with, with everybody. I will wait for sure, and uh, be followed every six months, as Miguel said, and uh, every year, probably, yeah. Okay, Burkhard, would you go for hearing preservation surgery from the outset, or would you have serial imaging? No, I would ask uh, Professor Lennertz to perform tomorrow morning the surgery. Okay, that's very interesting. <laughs> and I presume retrosigmoid with attempted hearing preservation, yeah? Uh, retrosigmoid approach, yeah. With, okay, with, okay. Right, I think while well, we've been around everybody, um, just if you're interested to know what I would do, and a lot of my time is spent managing patients with a vestibular schwannoma, I would uh, have serial imaging, and if it grew, I would perhaps go to Madrid and have a translabyrinthine approach. And like Vitold, I would front load my hearing loss. I, I would take my hearing loss now, to maximize the chances of preserving my facial function. But there you go. I think we have to stop now. Time is leaving us. So I'm just going to hand over to... Uh, can I thank you all for your contribution, which I hope was of interest. And of particular interest to me was that we found very few areas where we agreed on everything. So there is still clearly a lot to be done in otology. Um, thank you, Jacques. Um,
of course, from Utrecht, we would like to thank everybody and all the energy everybody put in, A, to be able to run the day, all the testing that we've done before, etc., and then have all the patients ready at the right time and do the surgery. I think the quality of our transmission this uh, session on both channels was very, very good. We had some exceptional uh, standard definition, actually, pictures from some of the centers, and it's really quite impressive. Uh, we are very thankful that everybody was, was in, um, and I think it went very well. So, uh, compliments to all the surgeons, and especially, of course, uh, the moderators had a hard time because there weren't many moderators to take over. So, Shaquille did his best, but was felt, felt quite lonely all day, but had to moderate by himself almost. <laughs> Okay, okay. So he was tired to begin with, I understand. And of course, all the other operators, uh, John Oates, etc. And of course, our technical staff, including Bert Andre and all the residents and doctors that helped to set up everything here. Because we, apart from the OR, need to set up the conference and, and the moderations hubs. Thank you all. And um, the date for the Winter Lion will be set, I think, in the business meeting that will follow. So we'll let you know as soon as we know. Uh, through the mailing list that Robert uh, uses every time. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.